Um, thank, thank you all for attending. And what we're doing here is a structured six session Zoom Dharma teaching <laughs> with Lama Kathy. Um, we have two Thursday nights in August, two in September, two in October. We will go through the book in its entirety. And Lama Kathy will be online for the first hour of each of these sessions. Uh, taking East Coast time into account, it's later for her. Uh, after, I think we'll do just some sitting practice for a while and then open it up for discussion. And so I'm um, glad you're all attending. And our future plans are to have more structured programs online uh, with Lama Kathy and other Lamas from KTD, as well as Deborah Ann, who we all know who leads our sitting practice one night a month. So um, I do want to make mention of a couple things. I want to make sure that if there's any dedications tonight, uh, we want to dedicate this to the passing of Bruce's mother, Dory Brent, and also an old Dharma friend who used to come to our KTC. And I saw his name is Sean Coleman. Some of you met him. And he posted a note today on Facebook that he had had two seizures and was going to the hospital and wasn't sure that he would make it. Mm. Uh, that was 12 hours ago that he posted that. So let's keep these people in our prayers along with if anybody else wants to silently or, or verbally mention or, or say any other dedications. And then I think Lama Kathy can begin. <laughs> Um, I'll dedicate to um, Bill Blue, the father of uh, former Columbus KTC director, Aaron Blue. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly this morning so um, in Florida. So um, please remember him. Okay, thank you for your, um, for your thoughts and dedications. Uh, thanks very much uh, to all of you uh, in Santa Monica for inviting me to come and talk about, uh, about Dharma. Um, I, I, um, I really uh, enjoy uh, taking questions and so on, but uh, as uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, I, uh, I probably, I may not be taking a lot of questions this time, but I do want to uh, assure you that if you have questions, you can type them into chat. Uh, even uh, even if I can't answer them this evening, I will try to get to them. Uh, if you guys can uh, not resolve them in your discussion period, I'd be happy to uh, to address them next week. So um, this way we can. I'll try to address what questions I can. So if you have questions that come up while I'm teaching, if you wouldn't mind uh, typing them instead of um, instead of putting your hand up, that would be super because then we can get through the material. The, um, I, I just can't tell you how excited I am to be talking about this book, uh, The Aspiration Prayer for Mahamudra. Uh, and this was, um, the prayer itself was written by the third Karmapa, Rangjung Dorje. And this uh, commentary was written by Tronga Rinpoche, who many of you will know from his other books. And some of you may actually have met or attended his programs. He's a remarkable Dharma master, and uh, to have him explain this prayer is really amazing. Uh, part of the reason that uh, I suggested this particular book is because the name of the center uh, that, uh, that we're talking about here is uh, Karma Takes Some Choling. Karma means we're from the Karma Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, and Take Some means the three vehicles of, of Buddhism. The, uh, the foundational vehicle, the Hinayana, the uh, Mahayana, and the Vajrayana, and that the Chuling means Dharma place. So this place uh, that, uh, that we call uh, Santa Monica KTC represents the Karmakaju tradition of Tibetan Buddhism and uh, the teachings of the three uh, the three vehicles. So uh, that's just a little bit about, um, uh, about the the reason that I'm kind of excited about this, uh, this project. Um, the, uh, I guess you can say that um, um, 
that we have in the Vajrayana, um, it's such a rich set of teachings that, uh, that we wouldn't maybe even know where to start when we started talking about Vajrayana. But uh, because there are lineages of Tibetan Buddhism, we have an organized method of studying and practicing the Dharma. And the lineage that we are part of provides that structure. And the structure that it provides will help us as we progress on our Dharma path. Um, many of us started uh, in our Buddhist practice and, and uh, teaching uh, because we wanted to learn how to meditate. And so our, our teachers in Tibetan Buddhism, the Tibetans who first brought the uh, Buddha teaching, Buddhist teachings to us in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and beyond, uh, these masters uh, all began with the teaching of shamatha or calm abiding meditation. But there, uh, there are other practices as well. And these practices uh, are part of the three yanas. Now, the Hinayana practice for us is quiet sitting meditation or shamatha. It helps us to uh, calm the mind and stabilize the mind. And it also allows us to understand uh, how our mind creates our experience of the world. And by understanding how what we think, do, and say makes a difference, then we begin to work with our karmic accumulation and we begin to understand how our habits have led to our experience in the world right now. And we begin to make hopefully better choices because we have slowed down our minds a little bit through the practice of meditation. So just as uh, quieting the mind allows us to see individual thoughts and habits and begin to make changes in those individual thoughts and habits, it also allows us to take on new habits and develop new habits of, uh, of life. And one of the great teachings of the Mahayana Buddhism is the practice of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. These are called the four immeasurables. And they're immeasurable because they bring great happiness to us. Practicing uh, love for ourselves, taking care of ourselves, practicing compassion for ourselves and taking care of ourselves and others. By practicing love and compassion and equanimity, we can have a life that is full of joy. And so beginning to do uh, the practice practices of a bodhisattva or practicing bodhicitta, we develop the motivation for making positive changes in our life. So shamatha from the Hinayana leads us to the practices of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity in the Mahayana, which allows us to have happier lives. And this allows us to practice on the nature of mind, understanding the nature of mind, which is our Vajrayana practice. Vajra means indestructible. And when we're talking about the Vajrayana, we're talking about relating to our own indestructible Buddha nature. And uh, as you will learn when you, because um, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, little bits of reading tonight that you'll be able to do between now and next week. Um, as you will learn, the Vajrayana is divided into two paths, the path of liberation and the path of skillful means. And the path of liberation is learning how to meditate on the nature of mind. And the path of skillful means uh, is, um, I'm sorry, the path of liberation is how to meditate on the nature of mind through shamatha and vipassana or from tranquility and insight. And the uh, path of skillful means is how to recognize and understand our Buddha nature through the practices of, uh, of deity, uh, deity yoga, sometimes called the mantra practice or mantra yana and by understanding uh, yogic discipline as well. So the easiest of all these practices for us to do is the practice of mantra. And so many of us start our Buddhist practice of mantra by doing simple mantra practices such as uh, Chenrezig, the Bodhisattva of compassion, Amitabha, the Buddha of boundless light, Green Tara, the, uh, the, the goddess of uh, active compassion, 
uh, white Tara, the goddess of longevity, and so on. So by doing these types of practices, we gradually begin to understand our own Buddha nature and begin to actualize our own Buddha nature. So this, these are our three yanas. The practice of the Hinayana is shamatha, which allows us to calm the mind and make better decisions about our actions, thoughts, and words. The Mahayana trains us in new habits of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And the Vajrayana allows us to recognize the, the ultimate nature of our mind, which is has the capacity to know itself. Our mind has the capacity to recognize its own nature and become Buddha ourself. So that's a, a little bit about uh, where we're starting from and why we're talking about what we're talking about. The practice of, uh, of Mahamudra is part of the path of liberation of the two paths of the Vajrayana. And um, the Mahamudra uh, is, uh, I guess you could call it our family heirloom of, uh, as Kar Karmakaju practitioners, because our lineage has developed methods of teaching Mahamudra going back 900 to 1,000 years. As you know, Buddhism itself is 2,600 years old, but the practices of the Mahamudra tradition, although taught by the Buddha Shakyamuni during his lifetime, uh, I brought were, I'm excuse me, the, they, uh, they came to, I guess you could say, a new light about 1,000 years ago when the great Indian master Tilopa accomplished awakening after studying uh, the sutra traditions of Mahamudra and attained uh, Buddhahood himself. Upon his attainment of Buddhahood, he had a vision of the Buddha Shakyamuni in the form of a, uh, of a, of a Buddha wearing silks and jewels uh, that was blue in color, holding a Vajra and a bell, symbolizing wisdom and skillful means. And this uh, Buddha, Buddha Vajradhara, gave him uh, direct essential teachings, uh, you could call them pointing out instructions on the nature of mind that he then used to deepen his Mahamudra practice. And then these were the teachings that he began to pass down through uh, the lineage of Mahamudra. And so um, I think if I am lucky, I'm going to be able to show you um, uh, some uh, a teaching here, if I can pull this together. Uh, let's see, that is not the one. Uh, here we go. All right. Okay, let's see if I can do a screen share. Do I have the technical know how to do it? And the answer is maybe. There we go. We did it. So, um, so what we're seeing here is um, the, uh, the Karmapa's uh, website, uh, kaguoffice.org. And uh, this is the page devoted to the Karmakaju lineage. This image is a, uh, is a sculpture uh, done in um, butter of the, uh, that is used as a decoration for a large torma offering. Now torma is a food offering, but they can become very, uh, the decorations on them, or again on these can become extremely ornate. You see these chrysanthemums here and so on. And this is one of the masters of the Karmakaju tradition, Gampopa. He was one of the Tibetan masters of uh, the Kaju lineage. Uh, the, the, the Kaju school of Tibetan Buddhism does trace its origin back to the Buddha Shakyamuni. And the most important source for the specific practices that characterize the Kaju order is the great Indian yogin, uh, Tilopa, who lived uh, in 900 to 1069, one of the 84 Mahasiddhas of India who first developed the spontaneous insight of enlightened realization. He gained this realization through the methods that were taught by the historical Buddha to his closest students, methods that continued to be practiced during the time of Tilopa. In turn, the realization of these masters was passed down through their disciples through the great forefathers of the lineage, the Indian Mahasiddha Naropa, the uh, great Tibetan translator Marpa, and Milarepa, the great yogi of Tibet, and then to Gampopa, whose coming was prophesied by the Buddha himself. And so, um, so what you could say is that this realization of Tilopa and the teachings he received from the Buddha Vajradhara 
um, then were transmitted from one generation, one spiritual generation to the next, to today. What amazes me when I look at pictures of the Karma Kaju lineage refuge tree, which you may have seen uh, in illustrations in books, there are 42 lineage holders of the Mahamudra tradition that were of the Karma Kaju uh, uh, tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. And each one of those people actually lived. And each one of those people worked very, very diligently on their meditation practice and accomplished Buddhahood. And so it is through their efforts that we receive these teachings in an unbroken line. And part of the reason that I wanted to teach this particular book was to, to be able to pass along to you the joy that I felt in learning about the Karmakaju tradition, these 42 masters who actually lived and actually attained Buddhahood and protected and nurtured and wrote about and developed methods of teaching for the Mahamudra that we can use today. So this lineage essentially is being handed to us by all of these great masters of the past. So it's being put into our hands now in the methods of meditation that we're being taught uh, at the center level. And, uh, and so in any case, I wanted to at least introduce you to these, uh, to these masters. The primordial Dharmakaya Buddha and source of realization is the Buddha Vajradhara, who then gave these teachings to Tilopa, the first Kaju uh, teacher and master of Mahamudra and Tantra, uh, one of the 84 Mahasiddhas. And then he gave his teaching to the, uh, the Indian scholar Naropa, uh, who was a great scholar of the Nalanda Monastery and a Mahasiddha and student of Tilopa. And then Marpa traveled uh, a dangerous route from uh, Tibet to India to receive the, the teachings of the lineage from uh, the Indian uh, Mahasiddhas uh, Naropa and Maitripa. And then uh, Marpa gave his teachings to the Tibetan yogi uh, Milarepa, who was famous for his songs of realization. And uh, Milarepa was extremely uh, well known because he achieved Buddhahood in a single lifetime. He was introduced to the Dharma and within uh, a single lifetime, he attained Buddhahood. And then he taught the uh, Tibetan uh, physician, scholar and monastic Gampopa who uh, synthesized the yogic and Kadampa uh, traditions uh, and was the teacher of the first Karmapa. Do some Kempa. And so um, I'm going to uh, leave with you the, uh, the links to this page so that you have a sense of, uh, of who these uh, great masters were. And you can learn a little bit about the Kaju scriptures, um, the Kanjur and uh, Tenjur. Uh, Kanjur is the, the actual translated words of the Buddha, and the Tenjur, which are the translated treatises explaining the um, commentary, these are commentaries on the great sutras of the Buddha. Uh, it was, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche in a number of his lectures has said that people ask sometimes why the Tibetans don't spend more time studying the sutras in their original Sanskrit. And uh, he basically said that the scholars, because uh, they, uh, they understood and studied deeply, wrote commentaries on the sutras and that mainly the Tibetans to save time uh, would actually study the commentaries so that the scriptures were illuminated and they could be more easily understood and digested. And so uh, then the great masters, all of them uh, gave teachings that were written down. Uh, Tilopa gave the Ganges Mahamudra instructions, which are still used today. I've received the reading transmission for the Ganges Mahamudra uh, from Garchen Rinpoche a number of years ago, and then received them uh, 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 a couple of years ago from Lama Karma Drodol, who himself had received the reading transmission, um, and so on. And so uh, all of these great yogis, Marpa, Milarepa, and so on, spoke or sang songs of realization that have come down to us through the eras and that these teachings uh, crystallized many of the teachings of Mahamudra. And the Karmapas themselves have played an important role in preserving the lineage. And for the last 900 years, 
the, the Karmapas have been the holders, the principal, hold, and their uh, disciples have been the principal holders of our lineage. So um, the first Karmapa, Dusum Kempa, the second Karmapa, Karmapakshi, and uh, then the third Karmapa, Rangjan Dorje, were uh, great meditation masters who also wrote many treatises about Mahamudra. The ninth uh, Karmapa, Wangchuk Dorje, is uh, famous also for writing three uh, handbooks on how to practice uh, Mahamudra. And so um, I'm not going to go into uh, this evening because there's not enough time, the uh, Tantra and Mahamudra journeys, because uh, we talked a little bit about the path of skillful means. Uh, and we talked a little bit about uh, mantra practice, the development stage and the completion stage. And uh, you can do a little bit more reading about it here. Also the path of liberation, which is the uh, practice of Mahamudra itself. I'm going to say something. I'm going to read a little bit of this to you. It's the, uh, the path of liberation uh, is the pra practice of the most renowned Mahamudra, which is uh, called Chaja Champo or the great seal, uh, which sometimes the word seal means authenticity. Like this document is authentic because it bears a seal. Kempo Kartha Rinpoche told me that one of the reasons the word seal or authenticity great authenticity is, um, is used is because one, uh, a person will authentically recognize the nature of their own mind and uh, authentically uh, authenticate their own Buddhahood, essentially through their certainty and understanding the nature of mind. So another meaning of this is that it seals, uh, the practice of Mahamudra seals all of one's experience with wisdom. So, um, the, uh, the, the highest meditation training and unique feature of the Kaju tradition in Gampopa's lineage, there were three ways of giving Mahamudra instruction or the three types of Mahamudra. Uh, the Sutra Mahamudra, the Mantra Mahamudra, and the Essence Mahamudra. Gampopa, whose coming was prophesied by the Buddha, taught Mahamudra in these three different ways. And this, these three methods have become a tradition in the Kaju lineage. This tradition and the lineage continued to the present day. So um, we won't get into this too much, but uh, those of you who remember the Mahamudra lineage supplication will know about the four greater and eight lesser, which they're now calling, uh, calling the four elder and the eight younger, or the four main and the eight additional schools. And so you can read all about your Karmakaju history on this page. So I wanted to start out by uh, saying a couple of things about that. And then to say uh, one more thing about this page, which I, I found very important. Uh, the golden rosary of the Karmakaju tradition, Marpa, Milarepa, and Gampopa. And so you can also read this page to understand the life stories of the great masters, Marpa, Tilopa, Naropa, and so on. And uh, so you can learn a little bit more about the history from this page. So that's, uh, that's I just wanted to start with a little bit of uh, what you might call uh, book learning. <laughs> so uh, I have a few minutes now, if you have some questions about this first part, or if you have anything that you wanted to hear more about. And I think people are permitted to unmute themselves so you can unmute if you have a question. Um, I have a question, but not uh, uh, about the teachings, which were very clear. I okay. can't put my video on because it says uh, only the host can let me put my video on. Oh, video, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for saying that. I, oh, that's right. Thank you very much. I apologize for that. I, I must have hit that accidentally. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Okay. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I must have hit that by accident when I was going through doing something else. See, the technical know how. Now, did you say you had a question or it was just the video question? It was a video, but. Uh, uh... I will go back, you know, you've taught us uh, these uh, things. I have heard uh, you before on the outline of this. 
-hmm. And for some reason, it can't, I mean, I am, you know, I follow it and everything else, but when I leave it, uh, it goes away from me. <laughs> I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but my mantra stays and my, uh, uh, yeah, and my visualizations, Chen uh, Tara, etc. So, but thank you. Thank you for teaching. Yeah. No, I, I really do appreciate that because um, I know that uh, uh, the founder of, of the Karma Takes and Cholings, um, Kempo Carter Rinpoche, he said that really the most important thing was to practice and to, and to have a practice that you feel connected to and that uh, have a practice that you can keep with you always because our mind is what we're working with in whatever form of meditation we're doing whether we're doing shamatha or compassion meditation or mantra meditation, we're working with our mind. And to be able to work with our mind is really important because we take our mind with us everywhere, right? We take it, we take it to work, we take it to, to see our families, uh, we take it in happiness and in unhappiness. We take our mind with us when we're uh, healthy. We take our mind with us when we're not healthy. We take our mind with us at the end of our lives. So being able to, to have uh, a practice, that a, a mind-based practice that we can take as our own and, and have as our own is really, it's a valuable thing. So thanks for sharing. <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Anybody else um, have anything they'd like to say? Mama Kathy? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, 42, um, not line lineage masters, but 42 teachers within the lineage, which supported teaching, right? Is, uh -huh. it, is that um, like the same in the guru yoga practice? The so same 42? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The 42 lineage holders, holders. Uh, who, who basically followed each other through mm -hmm. history. You know, mm -hmm. it's really interesting, right? This Tilopa received the teaching, then he gave it to Naropa, and then Naropa gave it to uh, Marpa, and Marpa gave it to Milarepa. And so essentially these 42 individuals uh, over this 900 year period, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, have passed it down from, uh, from uh, ancient times to now. And what's so cool about that is that it's alive the the teachings are alive because someone has practiced them in every generation every spiritual generation so these practices have just gone on and on and on <laughs> and that to, to me that that's part of why i wanted to talk about history first because like i say realizing that there were real people who did this just kind of inspires me like even if i am not like the world's best meditator that's okay. They kind of got me. They, you know, they, they, you know, like oh, they, they're going to catch me, you know, <laughs> because they, they were able to hold that and to practice that. So thank you. Thank you. There's time for one more. Is there another one out there? Okay. Well then it's uh, it's, it's time to, um, to uh, do the aspiration of Mahamudra prayer. Uh, and then we'll start by talking about the, the first uh, few lines. Um, the aspiration of Mahamudra of the definitive meaning was written by the third Karmapa. And, uh, and he wrote it, um, Remember I said that the, that the Tibetans didn't have like books and couldn't practice or read and study the sutras, but they often would um, read commentaries and so on. Another form of teaching uh, was, the, was the prayers that these great masters wrote. And so sometimes what you'll see is that the prayers they write, the aspirations that they write, are incredibly meaningful and actually small teachings in themselves. Uh, in themselves, because a lot of people say, wow, Mahamudra is so hard. Well, you know, it's so hard to understand, but 
if you can recite some of these prayers, such as this aspiration of Mahamudra uh, and also the Mahamudra lineage supplication, the one we do at the beginning of Chenrezig practice. Uh, uh, every time we do Chenrezig, we recite the Dorje Chang prayer. Dorje Chang Chen Te Lo Naro Dang, right? So, so we recite these prayers and they're like little teachings. And so um, I'm going to recommend uh, that you read over this prayer um, at least once a week during the time that we're studying it. And uh, what I find is that if you repeat a prayer in English many, many, many times, uh, the prayer begins to teach you. And so that's part of the reason why I'm kind of tickled that this, uh, this class will take a, a, a few sessions to complete. Uh, so that you have a chance to read this prayer maybe once a week. It, it's going to take about 10 minutes to, to read. Um, so you get to read it every week and give yourself a small teaching uh, coming from his, the, the third Karmapa to you. So um, I'm going to see if I can make uh, screen sharing work one more time. Okay, Let's see if we did it. Did we do it? Yes, we did it. All right. I apologize um, uh, for, the, uh, for the print being so small, uh, but uh, I'm going to recite the prayer and, um, and uh, uh, I'm gonna maybe uh, like uh, throw, a, a, what is it, uh, toss a coin or something. And then uh, every week, if anybody has an interest in reading, being the reader for the prayer for the group, uh, you can uh, let, uh, uh, Max and Jody and Daniel know if you would like to be the reader for the prayer on a particular week, and then we'll, we'll let you read the prayer. So it begins, Namo Guru. Uh, uh, guru, Yidams of all mandalas and Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the ten directions and three times, kindly consider me, support and bless the fulfillment of my aspirations. Streams of virtue unsullied by threefold fixation are born on the snow-covered mountain of the pure intentions and actions of myself and all innumerable, innumerable beings. May they flow into the ocean of the Buddha's four kayas. Until that is attained throughout all births, all lives, may even the words wrongdoing and suffering be unheard. May we enjoy the splendor of an ocean of happiness and virtue. Acquiring the best leisure and resources, may we have faith, diligence, and wisdom. Relying upon good spiritual friends and receiving the essence of the instructions, may we practice them properly and without obstacle. In all our lives, may we practice genuine dharma. Hearing scripture and reasoning frees from the unknowing. Contemplating the instructions conquers the darkness of doubt. The light of meditation clearly reveals the nature as it is. May the brilliance of the three wisdoms increase. The ground is the two truths beyond the extremes of eternalism and nihilism. Through the supreme path of the two accumulations beyond the extremes of exaggeration and denial. The fruition, the two benefits beyond the extremes of samsara and nirvana is attained. May we encounter dharma free from error and deviation. The ground of purification is the mind's nature, the union of lucidity and emptiness. What purifies is the great Vajra Yoga of Mahamudra. What is purified is the stains of the adventitious. May the result of purification, the stainless Dharmakaya, be revealed. Severing misconceptions of the ground is certainty of the view. Sustaining that without distraction is the point of meditation. Training in all aspects of meditation is the best action. May we have the confidence of the view, meditation, and action. All dharmas are the mind's manifestations. The mind, there is no mind. It is empty of mind's essence. Empty, it is unceasing and can appear as anything. Having scrutinized it, may we find it. We mistake self-appearance, which has never existed, to be an object. Under ignorance's power, we mistake self-awareness to be a self. Under the power of dualistic fixation, we wander in the expanse of samsara. 
May we get to the bottom of ignorance and delusion. Not something, it is not seen even by Buddhas. Not nothing, it is the ground of all samsara and nirvana. This is not a contradiction. It is unity, the middle way. May we realize the mind's nature beyond extremes. Nothing indicates this, saying it is this. Nothing negates this, saying it is not this. Beyond the intellect, dharmata is not composite. May we realize the perfect ultimate truth. Not realizing this, we circle in the ocean of samsara. If this is realized, Buddhahood is not elsewhere. Everything is this. There is nothing that is not this. May we know dharmata exposing the all basis. Appearances are mind, emptiness is also mind. Realization is mind, delusion is our own mind too. Arisen, it's mind. Stopped, it's also mind. May we sever all misconceptions in the mind. Not sullied by the meditation that is conceptual effort, not stirred by the wind of ordinary distractions, May we know how to rest naturally and freely, not altering. May we be skilled in and sustain the practice of the mind. May the subtle and coarse waves of thought be naturally calmed. May the river of mind unmoving come to natural rest. Free from the polluting stains of torpor and dullness, may the ocean of shamatha be unmovingly stable. When looking again and again at the mind, which has nothing to look at, nothing to see is vividly seen as it is. This is the resolution of doubts about what it is and is not. Without delusion, may we recognize our own nature. Looking at objects, there are no objects. Looking at the mind, there is no mind. Looking at both, dualism is liberated in its own place. May we realize the clear light, the mind's nature. This freedom from mental engagement is Mahamudra. Beyond extremes, it is the great middle way. As it, this includes everything, it is also called the great perfection. May we gain the confidence that to know one is to realize the meaning of all. Unceasing great bliss without attachment, the unveiled clear light free from conception and spontaneously present freedom from thought beyond intellect, may effortless experiences be unceasing. May clinging to experiences as good be naturally liberated. May the delusion of thoughts being bad be purified in the expanse. May ordinary mind with nothing to remove or add to lose or gain, unelaborate, the truth of Dharma Ta be realized. Although being's nature is always Buddha, not realizing it, we wander in endless samsara. May unbearable compassion arise in us for all beings who suffer endlessly. The display of unbearable compassion is unceasing. Within that affection, its empty nature arises nakedly. May we cultivate this integrated path without error constantly throughout day and night. The eyes and clairvoyances produced by meditation, the ripening of beings, the purification of Buddha realms, and the completion of aspirations to the Buddha's qualities, may we perfect completion, ripening, and purification, achieving Buddhahood. Through the compassion of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Ten Directions, and the power of whatever pure virtue there is, may the pure aspirations of myself and all beings be fulfilled in accord with our intentions. Thank you. Um, I'll recite a short prayer. Sanjay Chudon Sochi Chunam La Chanchu Badu Dani Chapsuchi Daji Jin Soji Pe Sanam Chi Trola Penchu Sanjay Drupa Show. Palin Sawe Lama Rimbo Che Tagi Chi or Pe De Den Shola. Kadrin jembo gane che sante kusum taking a drip saldu so. Okay, thank you. So,
uh, that's a long prayer. And, uh, and you might say, wow, I like understood a little bit of that little bit. And, uh, and so this is sort of why I, I wanted to talk about the prayer because when a person reads it for the first time, it might seem and sound inspiring, but it also might make your head spin a little bit. And so uh, this is why I wanted to use um, uh, Tranga Rinpoche's commentary on this because uh, his commentary is so clear and, uh, and it's so easy to understand compared to uh, many, uh, many others that, <laughs> that we, might, uh, we might see. Um, I'm actually uh, going to, um, I, I thought about it, I, I given it some thought, and I actually think I am going to, um, uh, to use screen sharing to show the, uh, the part of the prayer that we're on or the part of the book we're on. Uh, for the for the benefit of people who might be watching the video and not have the book handy. So um, let's see if we can make that happen. Yep, there, I've, I finally learned how to do this. I've been sort of technologically challenged, but here we go. Um, let's see, I have time-wise, oh good, I have, um, another 15 minutes or so, maybe 20, because I'm going to, I'm, I'm willing to go past the uh, bottom of the hour uh, by a few minutes, because this was going to be an introduction, and there's a lot to cover. So um, in the introduction, he talks about how the third Karmapa was a great scholar and a profound meditator. And, uh, and so as a result, um, he composed this uh, aspirational prayer. And, and, uh, and he says, there are aspirations that can be accomplished and aspirations that cannot be accomplished. For example, we may think, may a flower grow on this table, but no matter how many times we make that aspiration, nothing will happen because none of the causal conditions for a flower to grow on the table are present. However, if we put a flower pot on the table, put a, a soil in it, put the seed in it, water the seed and so forth, later a flower will grow. Uh, and, but when we make the aspiration, may the realization of Mahamudra arise in my mind. We may wonder whether this aspiration can be achieved or not. If we make this aspiration and then we meditate, gathering the accumulations of merit and wisdom, study, develop good qualities and so on, then gradually this aspiration will be accomplished. So first we make the aspiration and then by the power of the aspiration, we practice diligently. And then due to our diligent practice, we are able to attain the fruition. And, uh, and so I think that, uh, that this is why Situ Rinpoche uh, said to us one time in Tibet, we have a saying, when you make aspirations, don't worry about practicality. In other words, he said, make the aspiration to achieve the highest that you can achieve. And so that's why prayers like this, although they may sound a little bit overly lofty, actually do have a point. And that point is that we do have Buddha nature. And because we have Buddha nature, we can realize Buddha nature. So making the aspiration, may I realize Buddha nature, is it, it's not a nonsensical aspiration. It's actually very practical and something that we could feasibly accomplish. But of course, we, uh, although we have Buddha nature and we may be <clears throat> years old, we have not yet fully realized our Buddha nature. And the reason for this is because we have uh, our, our uh, Buddha nature is covered by what they call the adventitious stains. And uh, there are uh, four veils that are said to cover the mind. There's basic ignorance. In other words, we don't know we have Buddha nature. So that's a, that's a problem. We won't, we won't be able to find our Buddha nature if we don't even know that we have it. 
Second, in habitual tendencies. Our habitual tendencies make us believe that everything that's happening in the world is solid, permanent, and unchanging. But that's not the case. But that's what we're, we're sort of thinking, well, there's no way I could attain Buddhahood. So we're either ignorant of the presence of our Buddha nature, and then we think, oh, you know, even if I thought about Buddha nature, I couldn't do it. Then uh, third, um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the third is that we develop uh, negative mental afflictions, or we have uh, the, the, the veil of kleshas or negative mental afflictions. And because of that, we accumulate negative karma. So if you look at it, it, we're kind of in trouble unless we practice dharma because our basic ignorance leads us to make mistakes about reality that causes negative mental afflictions and that causes karmic accumulations. So the idea of doing shamatha so that we can calm down our karma and practice love and compassion so we can improve our karma, that's a really good start. And then uh, the love and compassion also helps us tame our mental afflictions and begins to purify that. And then gradually through the practices of Mahamudra, we can also purify habitual tendencies and uh, basic ignorance. So, we're, uh, so this is why, even though we have Buddha nature, we haven't been able to see it up until now. And so, um, so what, what he does here is then he takes the, the prayer and he comments on each of the verses. And so uh, the first of the verses is Namo Guru, or which means I prostrate to the teacher. And he said that this is, um, to begin a prayer in this way is a Tibetan tradition uh, because he said that um, the, the word Namo is actually um, a Sanskrit word and Guru is a Sanskrit word. And so by saying uh, the opening salutation, honoring one's teacher, one is both paying homage to the source of our Dharma, our teacher, but also paying homage to the source of Dharma in history. It came to the Tibetans from the place that they still call the Holy Land of India. And so as a result, they use Sanskrit as a way of talking about their honor, both for the teacher and for the lineage of the practice and where it came from. So the next thing he talks about in verse one is he talks about, I love it. He, he gets ready to make an aspiration. He doesn't even start by making the aspiration. He says, we're gonna prepare for making the aspiration. And so, by, so he does this by praising the qualities of gurus, yidam deities of the mandala, victorious ones of the three times and 10 directions together with your sons, which I'm now going to say children, please consider us with compassion Grant your blessings so that these aspirations may be accomplished just as we intend. So let's look at the words first, gurus or teachers. But what's yidam mean? Yi is a Tibetan word and it means mind. And dam is a Tibetan word and it means bond or connection. Yidam deities of the mandala. Mandala is a Sanskrit word meaning center and surrounding center and surrounding. And you know from seeing mandala pictures that they depict the pure la land of a particular Buddha or Bodhisattva, the pure environment that surrounds that Buddha or Bodhisattva in the form of a palace. And that palace has four doors and, uh, and uh, four porticos and so forth and so on. And so the idea is that each of us has our own mandala around us. The mandala of our family, our coworkers, uh, our home and so on. All of these are our sort of obscured and sort of confused mandala. But if we practice the bond of the mind, in other words, if we practice a the mantra of a specific Buddha or Bodhisattva and take that 
uh, Buddha or Bodhisattva as our Yidam, or uh, in the old uh, in the old way of translating into English, they would actually in the old days, like the 1800s, they would translate the word Yidam as patron Buddha, like the Catholics talked about patron saints. So if a person took a patron deity or Buddha, they would meditate on the form of that Buddha and think that they had the form of that Buddha. They set aside their idea of their, uh, of their flesh and blood body and it visualized their body being made of light and being empty inside containing mantra syllables and so on. And so by meditating on one's body, through meditating on the body of the deity, the speech by meditating on the mantra or the speech of the deity, and the mind by uh, meditating on the essence of the deity, the seed syllable in the center and so on, by exchanging one's own idea of confused body, speech, and mind for awakened body, speech, and mind, we can then realize our Buddha nature. And so that's why we mention the gurus who are the teachers, the yidam deities of the mandala, because, in, because these are uh, how we will attain Buddhahood through hearing teachings from the Buddha, I mean, from the gurus and practicing uh, the practices and mantras of all the yidam deities. And then, so he speaks to them first, victorious ones of the three times in 10 directions, victorious over samsara. So this is the Buddhas and bodhisattvas who have themselves uh, re, um, overcome samsara and have realized Buddhahood. The three times are past, present, and future. 10 directions are north, south, east, and west, northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. So, and then up and down. So that's 10 directions. Please uh, come uh, and uh, together with your sons. So the Buddhas are uh, the awakened ones and the Bodhisattvas are the children. They're called the children of the Bodhisattvas because uh, sometimes they are called the heirs of the Bodhisattvas, together with your heirs or your children. Uh, so Buddhas are the awakened ones and Bodhisattvas are on the path toward awakening. Please consider us with compassion. Grant your blessings so that these aspirations may be accomplished as we intend. And so that's a little bit of a, uh, an explanation of the first verse. And so uh, we're basically saying in this verse, now that come back to it a second, um, please consider us and grant your blessings so that these aspirations may be accomplished for us. So in other words, we ask for their presence and blessing. And uh, now I'm going to talk about the second verse, uh, this it, as the foundation of the aspiration, Tranga Rinpoche talks about it. May all rivers, the accumulation of virtue, unpolluted by the three concepts flowing from the snow mountains of pure intention and action of myself and all infinite beings merge into the ocean, the four kayas of the victorious ones. Uh, there's a lot to unpack. These prayers are incredibly dense in how they're written. They're very packed with meaning. But here, don't you love the fact that he starts with a natural uh, a natural metaphor. He's talking about nature. He's talking about the snow mountains and the snow from the mountains uh, melting into a stream that then merges with the ocean. The snow mountain gives birth to the rivers that merge with the sea. And so this image, this natural image then is compared to pure virtue, the snow mountain, our own accumulation of good karma or pure virtue, the streams of uh, the accumulation of virtue unpolluted by the three, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the, the snow mountains of pure intention, pardon me. So the pure snow is our pure intention. And then the good karma is the river. And then the ocean is realization, which is the four kayas of the Buddha. It's said that a unit that, uh, Enlightenment is unitary, but its manifestations are many. And there are many different ways that a Buddha can manifest. There's the Buddha's body, the Buddha's speech, the Buddha's mind, and the totality of the Buddha's being. And this is a simplified way of talking about the four bodies of the Buddha. They're not literally bodies, 
but sometimes the four kayas are described as the body, speech, and mind, and, and, uh, and qualities and characteristics of a Buddha. Sometimes they're explained as the Dharmakaya, the enlightened mind of the Buddha, the Samboga Kaya, uh, the, um, the, the enlightened speech of the Buddha, the Nirmanakaya, I'm sorry, Nirmanakaya, I got this wrong. Nirmanakaya is the body, Samboga Kaya is the speech, and Dharmakaya is the mind. Uh, so sorry about that, got that wrong. And Svabhavavikaya is the inseparability of those three. But there are many other ways of describing the four kayas. Those of you who have this other wonderful book, The Great Path of Awakening by John Guncontrol, there is a footnote in the book that explains what the four kayas are. And if you're taking notes, it's footnote number 67. And, uh, and in this book, uh, footnote number 67 is on uh, page 80, and he explains it this way. Uh, this is Ken McLeod, the um, translator. He says, the four kayas, Buddhahood is described in terms of four kayas, which literally means bodies or aspects of being. The first is the Dharmakaya, being as truth. It is like space without beginning or end. Total simplicity beyond any logical determination and free of limitation and obscuration. The second body of the Buddha is the Sambhogakaya, or being as full of qualities. It, its domain is the pure realm of natural well being. It arises in a variety of forms as the expression of compassion and communicates awakening as transcending awareness to high level bodhisattvas. Then the third is Nirmanakaya or uh, being as expression. Its domain is the world of experience of sentient beings, and it reveals awakening in many different ways that inspire beings to seek freedom from ego-oriented existence. So one of the ways that Kempo Kartha Rinpoche explained this was that, that the Buddha is, uh, uh, the Buddha's awakening is the Dharmakaya, and that through compassion, this Dharmakaya expresses itself as the two kayas of form, the Nirmanakaya, which we can experience as ordinary beings, and the Sambhogakaya, which is how the Buddha is experienced by beings who are themselves on the levels of Bodhisattva awakening. The Sambhogakaya then is the uh, inseparability of all of them. The fourth is this, the Svabhavavakaya, or being as it is. It's not so much a fourth kaya as it is a way of expressing the inseparability of the preceding three. Although these are part of our being, right now they're obscured by our uh, afflictions, our mental afflictions and habitual tendencies and so on. So what this second verse is saying is, may we have the pure intention and may we have the positive virtuous action that will develop into awakening for us in the future, for us and all sentient beings. The last verse I'm going to talk about today is um, the third verse, which is a common foundation for the path. So he has started by praying and making an aspiration to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to be present with us. Secondly, he starts by saying, may we have pure virtue, good karma, and may we attain Buddhahood. And then in the third verse, he says, until we attain this fruition of Buddhahood throughout all of our lives, may evil and suffering be unknown, and may we enjoy the glorious ocean of happiness and goodness. In other words, may we be able to practice the Dharma. May we have a life that has, um, that is a precious human life where we can actually understand the Dharma and practice the Dharma. And may we not experience evil. May we not do evil things. May we not reap the, the consequences of evil things, which is suffering. And may we enjoy the uh, glorious ocean of happiness and goodness. And, um, and they're wishing this, he's, we're wishing this not just for ourselves, but for all sentient beings. So uh, this is where I'm going to uh, uh, pause uh, for this evening and see if anybody has uh, comments or questions uh, about these uh, first three verses and see sort of what you think about so far. How, how are we doing?
No comments, no questions. You can um, unmute and ask if you have a question. So yes. if you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Lama Kanthi, I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm currently 84 years old. And uh, in my youth, I think I've committed almost, maybe not everything bad, but quite a few, et cetera. So okay. now, you know, with the COVID, et cetera, and my age, and I lost a lot of my best friends oh, from COVID. Cool. And, you know, I go to the grocery store. I go to the sewing club meeting. I don't have enough interaction with people to, I, I think that I don't have enough interaction to, to develop my, uh, my, my compassion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any suggestion? I mean, I can't go. I don't think I can go to nursing homes and volunteer right. because of COVID. Of course, yeah. That was one idea I had to, because I'm a retired RN. One idea I had was oh, to go to nursing homes and to mm -hmm. be right. safely, etc., with the, the patients. But that's not possible now. So, yeah. what can I do to practice uh, the Dharma with interpersonal relationships? I, I really understand the um, the difficulty, and because one of the things that um, my teacher Kempo Carter Rinpoche uh, emphasized for me was that we we are very lucky to have lived as long as we have. We're very lucky, and and he said, and uh, we this is why we practice uh, the mantra of White Tara and Medicine Buddha, so that we can live as long as possible with decent health so that we can practice Dharma. So we, I think you're very wise in avoiding circumstances in which you might encounter illness like this. So I think you're doing the right thing by protecting your health. Well, I but wasn't even right. thinking of my own health. I was thinking, I know. Of how can I help others? Oh, I know. Uh, I, I, I have to apologize. I never give short answers. They're always really long. So that was just part one of my answer. <laughs> I am so, I so apologize. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a codependency trait and I'm working on it, but it, it just goes on. So in any case, um, there are methods of meditation that have been used for, for generations and generations that I think will help. And um, in one of these, uh, there are two that I can think of right off the top of my head that will help even in a circumstance where you cannot engage with other people directly. Okay, there's, there's actually now I've thought of the third one. But anyway, the, one of them is being able to sit on your meditation seat or in your, in, in your prayer chair, as my friend calls her seat. Uh, so you sit in your meditation seat and you close your eyes and you imagine sending love to all sentient beings. First, you start by sending love to people you feel close to. Then you, then you feel, then you send love to uh, beings you're not so close to. And then finally you send love to the people who kind of get on your nerves. Okay. <laughs> and we all, whether we are with them or not, have people who kind of get on our nerves. And so the best way to send them love is from a safe distance. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. And now you will have heard of the famous Tibetan teaching called Tonglen or sending and receiving. This is not so easy for other people, for everybody to do. So the metta or loving kindness practice, M-E-T-T-A metta, where you imagine that you're just sending out love to these beings. It doesn't have to be a really long practice. It could, you could get it done in like three minutes or five minutes. Just imagine just sending waves of goodness to all the people you feel close to, then to the intermediates, and then finally to the difficult ones. And when you do this, what my teacher told me, he said, right now, we're sort of closed in as whether we're closed in. I mean, he didn't, he, of course, passed away before COVID hit. But he was mostly talking about the fact that we sort of like live in our own little bubbles right? And we don't have as much interaction as we could. And so in this way, he said, you can, you can actually expand your love through the, through the use of your imagination. 
And he said, your mind has no limits. Your mind is as actually as vast as space. So as a result of your mind being as vast as space, your aspiration can be as vast as space. And this aspiration to spread love to all of these beings, he said, it's actually going to change you from the inside. So I think that you're going to be okay. So that's one. The second practice that you could do is our one of my favorites, and Ani mentioned it earlier, which is Chenrezy mantra. Uh, when uh, there's a there's a Chenrezy uh, practice on uh, my website, Lama Kathy L A M A K A T H Y Lama Kathy net, and it's called Chenrezy for beginners. But, uh, but the reason it's called for beginners is because on one side are the words. And on the other side is what you visualize. So they're like right next to each other. The guy who laid it out did a really good job. And when you are reciting the mantra, Om Mani Pei Me Hong, you have just imagined that all beings in the universe have been blessed by Chen Rezi and have turned into Chen Rezi. So you're Chen Rezi. All of your neighbors are Chen Rezi. All the people down the road are Chen Rezi. The politicians in Washington are Chen Rezi. Everybody <laughs> is Chen Rezi. And just for a few beautiful moments, all of you as Chen Rezi get to chant Om Mani Pei Mei Hong together. And again, through the use of the vastness of your potential imagination, you can actually imagine that the entire world transforms. And this also helps to purify negative karma from our previous life. Okay, whether it's the previous life in this lifetime or previous life in a previous lifetime, if we do this with the intention that it purifies our karma and other beings' karma, it will help. Okay, because Rinpoche said, yes, the Vajrasattva mantra is, is very famous for purifying karma. And yes, the Medicine Buddha mantra is very famous for purifying karma. But you can use any practice to purify karma if you put your mind to it like that. So those are two practices you can do right away. And in order not to take up too much time, the, 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 um, the third one is... Um, using your own mental afflictions as practice. Okay, so let's say you're watching TV and you're getting mad about something you're seeing on the TV. Maybe the news is bad or maybe somebody has done something bad and you get, get a little angry. So when you feel angry, you recognize that and you say, may I and all beings be free of anger and may we become Buddhas. <laughs> so this way, even if you're not engaging with people, you're going to be fine because you're going to be able to imagine all those people down the road in the nursing home as Chen Rezi, and you're going to send them love. And you know, you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lama Kathy. That's very helpful. And if, and if you try this and have questions about it, just, uh, just write them out and let me know. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. Uh, other questions that people might have. Well, yeah. when Barbara, when Barbara uh, said about being alone, for some reason, uh, Milarepa came to mind, where he went into a cave by himself for I don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are not quite in a cave, but uh, sometimes I think of myself as being like Milarepa by myself in a cave. Yeah. So if, I'm not saying if he did that, I can do it. But uh, it's like, it's possible. He was a human being uh, before That's he right. became Buddha. So um, for a little ant like me, maybe, maybe it's possible to, maybe that will, if you were to read uh, his book, um, Milarepa's book, so that might inspire you as well about being alone. Mm -hmm. I, appreci I appreciate you sharing that. There's also the story of um, uh, Gelongma Tenzin Palmo, uh, the woman, the British woman who did a 12 year retreat in, in a cave and it's called Cave in the Snow. Oh. And, and, and there's, it's just a remarkable story about this remarkable woman 
who uh, who was granted the title of Jetsunma. So she's essentially a, a woman Rinpoche, you know. And uh, and so um, I'm hoping that. Um, oh, she's uh, Jody is saying it's a great book. Oh yeah, Cave in the Snow. Okay, great. And uh, and so uh, I think it, these things can inspire us a little bit. So thank you for that. There's there's time for one more. Is there one more out there? Anybody have? You can unmute your microphone if you have a question. Or is there one in chat? Is there a question in chat? Okay. No, I don't see one. Okay. Well, uh, we got through the first class, everybody. We did it. Yay. Uh, I'm really, I'm really, really happy uh, to be part of this, uh, of this group and to be part of learning through uh, learning this book. And, uh, and remember, if you um, have an interest in, uh, in being our reader, uh, the next time we get together, and the next time we get together is, I have to look in my book. I have Thursday the 26th, am I right? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So if you have an interest in being our reader, what's going to happen is that uh, that when uh, tonight I read the prayer, but the next time somebody else will read the prayer. And then I may actually, if it's not inconvenient and it works out, I may actually call on people to read uh, the verses as I go through them. I did this with another group and it was a lot of fun. So, okay. I guess it's time to dedicate merit for, from my part. Uh, then you're going to have discussion uh, with, uh, with all of the friends from uh, Santa Monica KTC. And so um, I'll dedicate the merit of my little part, and then you guys can, uh, uh, can continue your discussion. And thank you again you know, for uh, inviting me to, to do this with you. So, okay. Let's gather together all of the merit we've accumulated from all of our previous lifetimes all that we will accumulate uh, in the future and all we are accumulating now and dedicate it to the liberation from pain, suffering, disease, and ignorance of all sentient beings. I'll recite the short prayer in English. Through this merit, may all achieve the omniscience of Buddhahood. May it defeat our common enemy, wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death, from the ocean of samsara, may we free all beings. May we free all beings. May we free all beings. Okay, everyone. Take good care of yourselves. Uh, we're we're all trying to stay safe these days. So please, so please uh, stay safe and be well. And uh, I will. Uh, I think I can leave without ending the session. It looks like I can do it. So. I'll, I'll leave it in your hands, folks. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, some folks are saying hello and goodbye. Okay, see you soon. Yeah, Jason, like, hey, a long time no talk to. Okay, okay. I, I hope you're doing your practice, everyone. <laughs> okay, take care. Omane pe mejor.